All right, let's get started. Um, the panel this morning is focused on bank solvency or in the discussions among the panelists, we've broadened that a bit to financial stability more generally uh, and monetary policy. Uh, as we all know in, in this room, in response to high and rising inflation, major central banks around the world raised their policy rates starting in 2022 uh, and also First, their balance sheet expansions to some extent. In the US, this has led to a 500 basis point increase in the policy rate and balance sheet reductions of $600 billion or about 7% of the initial asset level. So most of the discussion has focused on the pace of tightening and the, which was more rapid in the US than in Europe and the magnitude and timing of the economic response to the policy tightening. Um, and of course, the trade off between inflation and unemployment. But cracks in the financial sector earlier this spring have put more focus on the potential for instability, especially after the failures of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank in New York, the acquisition of First Republic Bank by JP Morgan Chase, and the collapse of Credit Suisse in Switzerland. This has caused some to ask how central banks should balance their inflation mandate against financial stability, specifically asking whether central banks should prioritize financial stability at this point, and whether that requires a change in rate and balance sheet policy. Or if instead prudence requires that rate and balance sheet policy remain focused, and that other regulatory and supervisory tools, for example, to such as capital payout policies and supervision you'd be used to address the financial stability concerns while acknowledging that the credit channel of monetary policy particularly in bank dependent countries which we'll discuss more today would transmit higher rates through tighter bank lending in any event these approaches have very different implications for the path of policy the need for legislation and other implementing measures and the risks for the economy, which may also differ across countries. So for the panel today, we're joined by Kristen Forbes, the Lemelson Professor of Management and Global Economics at MIT, and a former external member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Neil Kashkari, the President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and a current voting member of the FOMC. And Philip Lane is a member of the executive board of the European Central Bank and chief economist since 2019, who was previously governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. Uh, so we'll start the panel with Kristen's remarks. We'll have short remarks from each of the panelists first, then some discussion. Um, and if we're committed to time, we'll have uh, questions from the audience. Kristen. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So my role as the opening speaker alphabetically, and uh, also is the one who is not in an official policy job right now, is to provide a little background on the structure of thinking about potential tensions between monetary policy and banking solvency. So I'm gonna start with a broad overview of what the issues are, the frameworks we use to think about these issues, and then bring in a few examples from the UK, and then leave it to my colleagues to give you more information about the situation for the US in the Euro area. So let me jump right in. The topic for today, maybe is uh, there we go uh the two goals two worthy goals price stability and banking solvency these are both important they are both interlinked it is very hard to have price stability if you do not have solvent banks in a viable banking system banking system collapses that generally causes a deep and severe recession and undermines price stability the flip side, it's hard to achieve banking solvency when you have volatile inflation and you do not have price stability. So two important but interlinked goals. How do you achieve these goals? There's traditionally been a fairly standard division of labor where there's different tools to accomplish each of these goals. Uh, for example, solvent banks are best attained through good regulation and supervision, prudential regulation, macro prudential regulation, and if problems do emerge, usually best to address them through liquidity facilities. 
Uh, the flip side, to achieve price stability, the set of tools is generally interest rates. Just interest rates to achieve price stability, pretty straightforward. Uh, the one area, the tool where it's a bit of a fuzzy line is asset purchase programs. Asset purchase programs have been used to achieve both. Uh, for example, when COVID hit in March of 2020, large asset purchase programs were announced largely to stabilize financial markets, provide liquidity. So really aimed at sort of supporting the banking system and broader financial system. But then that morphed into asset purchase programs focused more on achieving macro stability, price stability and supporting growth and employment. Hopefully going forward, we're going to see more clarity when central banks use asset purchase programs. Is it more directed at solvency of banking systems or financial systems or more at broader price stability? But the lines have been muddied in the past. But more or less, when we're talking about achieving these goals, key role for price stability to obtain price stability is to use interest rates, banking stability, use regulation, supervision, et cetera. Now, where the line has become fuzzy recently in what is the focus of our panel is if there is starting to be more tension of the need to raise interest rates to achieve price stability, if that could start to undermine banking stability and banking solvency. And it's this tension, which again, I think is the focus of our panel. So how could this tension arise? So what I want to do for the remainder of my comments is just go through sort of basics of bank accounting to understand why there could potentially be a tension if central banks need to continue to raise interest rates, if inflation is more persistent than expected, how that could start to undermine the solvency of banking systems. So let me, I'm going to use an example of a stylized bank balance sheet called the Royal Bank, Royal Bank of the UK, where I'll draw some of my examples. Um, here's again, very simplified balance sheet of banks. Now, I think before we talk about the risks to banks from higher interest rates, it's important to start with what usually is the standard sort of standard issue is that usually low interest rates are bad for banks and higher interest rates are good for banks. I think there's actually a great irony, the period when I was at the Bank of England when interest rates were quite low, banks came in constantly complaining about low rates. So now that they're complaining about high rates, it's, it's quite a switch. Um, but the reason why central banks usually like higher interest rates is because the bulk of bank balance sheets is loans and deposits. And when uh, interest rates go up, banks charge more on their loans, but they also have to pay more on their deposits. But the, the uh, two rates don't go up to the same degree. Usually when interest rates go up, banks charge more on their loans or increase the rate they charge on their loans by more than they pay depositors on the deposits. So that differential, the net interest margin, usually goes up when interest rates goes up, especially when you're off the lower bound. Um, and banks can make a nice amount of revenues from this NIM, this net interest rate margin. A uh, nice presentation by Philip Schnabel yesterday talking about this, how on average when interest rates go up about 1%, uh, the, the differential is about 60%. So deposit rates go up by, by, by about 0.4, while the rate charged on loans go up by about 1%. So again, banks do well when interest rates go up. And I think that's important to keep in mind as we look at some of the hits that can happen to banks because of higher interest rates. Some of those losses in other areas of the balance sheet can be balanced by this increased revenue coming in from the net interest margins. Okay, so that's the good news for banks. Now, where's the bad news when interest rates go up? Let me just, uh, oh, sorry, one slide. Just for the UK, this shows the increase in net interest margins in the UK when rates were low, the revenue they made on this differential between what they charge on uh what they charge or pay on deposits and charge on loans was low when rates were low it's gone up and banks are now making a nice revenue stream from that okay so where can banks make losses as rates go up um the first area that's gotten the most attention from the runs that happen in the us are if there's a run on deposits we all know even well capitalized banks a lot of equity can go under very quickly if there's a large run um that risk has settled down. I think the bigger concern for banks now is that as interest rates go up, people are starting, people and businesses are pulling deposits to put them somewhere else where they can earn a higher return. This is sort of a slow bleed we're seeing in banks around the world. Um, we're seeing some of that in the UK. This is what's happening to household deposits in the UK. They went up quite a bit during the COVID when savings went up. Some of the drawdown we're seeing now is just people drawing down the savings they accumulated to, during COVID. That's the blue. 
but some of that money is being reallocated to other forms of savings. Some of it is still in the banking system in other forms of deposits. Some of it is going into buying gilts, the equivalent of treasury bonds. Some is going into other assets. So there's sort of a slow bleed of money coming out as depositors take money to earn a higher return. I mean, this for me seems like a manageable risk. This is traditional effect of monetary tightening. Um, as long as there's nothing that triggers a severe bank run. Again, this is part of the tightening cycle. And if deposit outflows start to accelerate because uh, depositors want to earn a higher return, banks could pay more on the deposits. Um, there is, especially because their profits have gone up quite a bit. So there is room to stem this sort of slow bleed if needed. Okay, so that's one risk. Turning to the asset side of the balance risk, where are other risks of higher rates? Another one that's gotten attention recently is the losses from bank holdings of government debt, gilts in the UK. Um, we heard quite a bit about this yesterday. NBEA research has highlighted some pretty scary numbers from the US. Um, if you calculate the losses on government hold, bond holdings in the US banking system, something around $2.2 trillion, if all of that is marked to market and realized right away, that's a big number, roughly equal to bank equity in the UK, in the US. Um, so, but those losses will only be realized if the bonds are sold. If they're held and rates come down a bit, um, you will not have those losses. Some of those losses could be paid off over time by higher revenues. Now, it's important to realize cross, from a cross country perspective, um, those losses aren't as big in other countries. Other countries are forced to mark to market. Um, and this is a nice graph that the OECD has put together. It estimates unrealized losses on the overall banking system in different countries from a one percentage increase uh, increase in interest rates. Uh, it looks like Japan also has a big problem in this area, but then Italy and the US. After that, most other countries are fairly low exposures to losses in the banking system from holdings of government bonds, in particular the UK is far to the right. So yes, this is something that should be watched. It should be, you should be holding some reserves against this, but especially if interest rates do start to come down, we will not fully realize all of the losses that we're hearing these large numbers about today. Okay, other risks on the asset side. The biggest area is loans. If the economy slows, we're gonna see more defaults and you're gonna see defaults from households on their loans and also from non-financial companies. How big a risk is that? So I, where there has been a lot of attention to the losses from higher interest rates in on mortgages, people being unable to pay their mortgages, and that potentially leading to defaults, which could hurt banks. Not surprised there's been a lot of attention. That's where the last crisis occurred in 2008. So this is where I feel like we do have a pretty good grasp of what the risks are. Banks have been pretty good about capital. Um, um hedging against this preparing for these risks because again we're always good at fighting the last war um and also i think these risks are not nearly as big today as they were in 2008 for example um a couple of reasons first here's the the key way to assess risks around higher mortgage interest rates putting pressure on households so they default on their mortgages you look at debt service debt household service ratio ratios or dsrs um, basically look at your ability to pay your debt relative to your income you see these are going up a bit in the countries we're talking about today um, but the, the debt service ratios are still quite low compared to where they have been in the past some countries these risks are quite a bit bigger for example, Sweden, Australia, Canada, that's from a combination of factors. One, those countries, people have just taken out more debt. And second, more of the debt is floating rate. So higher rates pass through more quickly. Um, but UK and US, the risks are smaller, partly because we have more fixed rate debt. Although in the UK, it's only fixed for two to five years. So those risks will come soon, um, but US risks are slower. Um, but two other reasons why I think these risks are manageable. One is, although debt service payments are going up, Incomes are going up too. Incomes are going up at a solid clip. Wage growth in the UK just announced yesterday, 7% annual wage gains. That helps cover higher interest payments. Um, the other factor, which I think hasn't gotten enough attention, is that as mortgage interest payments go up, this is data for the UK on the left, mortgage interest payments are going up. That's going to put pressure on some households. But the blue shows that households are also earning more on their savings. And even with any savings in the bank is now earning some real money. Granted, it's not the same people. People with mortgage debt aren't the, always the ones with savings. There could be different marginal propensities to consume. But overall on the right, it shows that on net, um, although people are still paying on net some, 
they're paying less because earnings overall on savings have gone up more than the increased payments they're making on their mortgages. So again, a risk to watch. Those costs will grow as some of the refinancing of mortgages kick in, but manageable. Uh, last one I'll talk about on the loan side, um, risks from defaults on loans to non-financial companies. A lot of attention to risks in the CRE market. Um, that is a real risk. CRE market has been hurt. Uh, commercial real estate values have gone down. Some of that is from higher rates. Some of it is from a readjustment of where people work. Cities, you're less people are working in cities, so that's a double hit on the CRE market. There's going to be losses there. But again, this is on the radar. Banks are calculating that and cap um, holding capital against it. And the sector of the non-financial companies I worry about more is um, small and medium enterprises. These are where small and medium enterprises don't have other places to go for funding other than banks. It's getting harder for them to get access to lending from banks. Default rates have gone up for SMEs. SMEs took on more debt during COVID than larger companies, and defaults have increased. They've come down some, but they're still high. And SMEs are an important source of employment. In the UK, it's about half of jobs. So if we see more um, challenges in this sector, this will start to bite um, and is something to watch. So the last one, which I will not have time to talk about, um, set of risks is from banks related to the non-bank financial sector, shadow banking system. I heard quite a bit about this yesterday in, in this room. Um, I think these risks are so diverse. Um, it's, again, hard to talk about in one minute, um, but hopefully in the panel we can talk about this as non-bank financial sector has grown in this era of tighter regulation on banks and low interest rates. The non-bank financial sector is now shrinking, and that will involve some risks to banks that are harder to assess because it comes from some very different sectors. So to tie it all up, some final thoughts, key points to take away. Um, some tightening in financial conditions is necessary. It's part of the adjustment to achieve price stability. Inflation is too high in most of the world. We have to tighten financial conditions. It's going to affect banks in the broader financial system, but the impact on individual banks and bank solvency will depend on the specific exposures and financing of the individual banks. Some banks are going to gain through this process from higher interest rates. Um, others will not. Um, but should all this imply that we should diverge from our standard division of labor when adjusting rates? Should we back off tightening interest rates because of concerns for banking solvency? Um, I think that's a very high bar and we haven't reached it yet. Um, yet, at least we might in the future, but at least not yet. I think in order to sort of hold off raising interest rates to address inflation, you must have a real risk to bank solvency that is not better addressed through other channels. And at least for the UK, I don't see much tension today between price stability and bank solvency. The priority for the UK needs to be bringing inflation down. Uh, this is core inflation. Uh, take out the temporary effects of energy, food prices. Core inflation is starting to turn around. It's still too high in advanced economies around the world, especially in the UK. It's about 7% in the UK. This does not seem the time to back off raising interest rates because of concerns about bank solvency. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Is it on? Um, and the next speaker is Neil Kashkari. Uh, good morning. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's great to be here uh, participating in this important conversation. Uh, let me just give a preface that my comments are reflect my own views don't necessarily reflect others in the Federal Reserve System or the Federal Open Market Committee. This morning, just a few moments ago, I published an essay on the Minneapolis Fed's website and on threads uh, that goes through my that goes through my comments in a lot more detail. And so I'm just going to give you a very quick summary of that here. And I look forward to the discussion with my uh, fellow panelists and with all of you. Uh, in order to preserve anchored inflation expectations, central banks must bring inflation back down to their targets in a reasonable period of time. But price stability, and in the case of the Federal Reserve, also maximum employment, are not our only objectives that central banks must aim to achieve. As Kristen just said, ensuring financial stability is, our, is also a primary responsibility for central banks because financial crises can cause great hardship to Main Street. Now, managing inflation and financial stability are usually distinct and often complementary goals where central banks' limited policy tools can simultaneously work to support both objectives. But these goals can come into tension at times, creating a dilemma for policymakers 
to decide which objective to prioritize. In recent months, such a tension arose when some regional banks in the US ran into trouble due to security losses triggered by poor risk management at these firms in the context of policymakers having raised interest rates to combat high inflation. Although today, overall, the banking system is sound and resilient, bank stresses nonetheless could emerge again. In my view, given the risks that these banks have taken on, the outlook for some regional banks largely depends on what happens to inflation. Now, if inflation falls as markets currently expect, then allowing policy rates to fall, bank balance sheet pressures would likely reduce as longer term rates fall, which would cause asset prices to climb. However, if inflation proves more entrenched than expected, policy rates might need to go higher, which could further reduce asset prices, increasing pressure on banks. In such a scenario, policymakers could be forced to choose between aggressively fighting inflation or supporting banking stability. Increasing bank resilience now could reduce the chances for such a difficult tension to emerge because banks would be positioned to handle further mark-to-market losses that would stem from higher policy rates. This would then minimize the risk that policymakers face a difficult choice between bringing inflation down and maintaining financial stability. However, the historical record shows that banks are unlikely to take meaningful action to enhance their resiliency against this risk on their own. In my essay, I walk through all of the options that banks have and how there are very few good options for banks. So bank supervisors should instead use their own existing authorities today to ensure that all banks are prepared to withstand a higher rate environment. So with that brief summary, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. And the last speaker is Philip Lang. Okay, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and, and it's, I think, a, a very well timed uh, session after, you know, a year of policy hiking at the ECB. Um, we, we know the lags in monetary policy are, are more than a year. So th there's a lot to, to think about and, and to discuss. And over the next year or two, we will learn quite a bit. And a bit like Neil, I, I did put out on the ECB website uh, a long version of what I'm about to say. I don't think threats has been released in Europe yet, so, so I'm afraid you will actually have to go to the ESP website. Um, so what I want to do is, first of all, raise a few issues about, you know, basically, which, you know, falls under, is this time different? You know, what is similar and what is different between the current configuration versus historical uh, tightening cycles? Uh, then I'm going to sprint through a few uh, basic charts uh, and then uh, offer a couple of final remarks, but again, all in the context of, of the more considered uh, argument is on the longer essay. So uh, let me point, point out a couple of things about, uh, just as a reminder, in terms of the European situation, in, in the last year, rates have gone up by, by 400 basis points. Um, and there's been a, a, a lot of shrinkage of the balance sheet. And again, to emphasize in the European context, it's quite different to here in the US, because yes, there is a, a, a roll off of the uh, asset portfolios, but the big reduction in the balance sheet so far has been the reduction in, in uh, this targeted lending program. So there's a very large creation of central bank reserves to, to uh, have a large lending program to, to banks during the, the pandemic, and that that is moving down quite quickly. So the overall contraction in central bank reserves so far has been mostly driven by that. Now, what I want to emphasize is the banking channel. I mean, you can go a long way, of course, just by looking at, well, how does the economy respond to interest rates? But the policy rate, but actually the whole yield curve you need to look at. 
But then, especially we know the area is a bank dependent uh, region, you do have to think about the different channels. We say, okay, uh, all of this is going to be intermediated, intermediated by banks. Uh, one element of that is the, is the balance sheet channel, which of course really is three components. One is the, the balance sheets of banks themselves, then the balance sheets of their corporate customers and also their household customers. The second is the bank lending channel in the sense of, you know, what are the, you know, what are the incentives to, to lend as opposed to hold uh, bonds or make other decisions uh, from a bank point of view? Uh, and then uh, whether it's a third channel or sub-channel of that it is the risk-taking channel. And again, when we have this tightening cycle, uh, does the attitude towards risk-taking change? So let me say that there's four categories of topics with, which you know, many people are discussing in terms of is this time similar or different? One, and again, uh, it's true in the US, it's, but it's definitely true in the, U, in the your area. If I go back to 2019, when I started at ECB, the dominant conversation in Europe is, is Europe turning into Japan? Are we turning into chronically low inflation? Uh, the, the pricing, the surveys and the pricing had policy rates would be negative for a long time and might barely get to a zero policy rate by late 2020s, which is not where we are now. So pre before the pandemic, that was the kind of conjecture. So essentially what's happened now is really two factors. One, there's been a permanent change in the sense of, unless something new happens, no one believes we're going back to negative rates. The surveys we have in the market pricing basically says X years from now, the policy rate will be about two, consistent with a real rate around zero. So minus 0 0.5 to two, is basically priced in forever. And then on top of that, the fact we're now at 350, probably going to 375 in the next meeting, that is a, if you like, kind of cyclical tightening, which people don't believe will last forever. And then in terms of instruments, no one believes we're going to go back to large scale QE or large scale targeted lending anytime soon. So the scale of the balance sheet uh, is it going to be a lot smaller than, than was previously expected? So compared to late uh, 2021, before we started turning, uh, the expected balance sheet now is probably running a trillion lower in, in terms in expectation, which is you know quite a turnaround. And then the question is, uh, when monetary, how does monetary policy work when you have not just a cyclical tightening but a long-term shift in policy? How does monetary policy work when it's not just about rates but it's also about the uh the basic choices facing banks and the fact uh this basic liquidity environment we, we lived in we also have to think about the fact that the balance sheets of, of uh, banks households and corporates look reasonably good going into this shock the pandemic was a windfall for european corporates large-scale fiscal transfers uh helped european corporates and European households, uh, because of forced saving, ha had a kind of a, a exogenous, if you like, improvement in balance sheets. And compared to 15 years ago, banks have a lot higher capital, have a lot higher liquidity than they did beforehand. And uh, all of those matter, but equally, we do have to think about in all of those cases, uh, what is the behavior behind that, as opposed to just saying, well, here, here's my state variable and how it moves things. And maybe I'll like make the last point, which I think is quite relevant for, for this year. There is a difference between how a, a supply-driven inflation shock operates versus a demand-driven. So last year, when we had this, um, last year, the year before, when we had these adverse supply shocks, we had inflation going up and basically downgrades to the economy. And both of those would be, I suppose, bad for, for bank decision making. Uh, whereas this year, we have the reversal of those supply shocks. So, we, yes, we do have interest rate hikes, but we basically do have a rising employment, as Kristen said, um, and, and uh, rising wages. Uh, and so, in the context of, if you like, the macro picture, some of those are, you know, do need to be counterbalanced. Whereas, if it's a reversal of a demand shock, which is maybe more in the US style, when that demand shock reverses, then the economy slows down, upper pressure on unemployment, and so on. So, so the interaction of the bank channel with, with that macro channel is, is relevant. Okay, so, so, so those are some open questions, but let me quickly point out a, a few issues here. So in terms of the, the funding costs facing euro area banks, 
you can see both in terms of the last 15 years and the last year or so, uh, you've had this fairly sharp increase where, of course, the most spectacular increase has been in if a bank wants to issue a bond, the cost to it of bond financing. The blue line is, is the composite uh, change, it's the balance across the different funding lines of banks. But let me emphasize is over time, that is moving because over time, uh, many European households work out, I need to make the effort to move out of my overnight deposit into a time deposit or even into a money market account and so on. So over time, the, the, the availability of these different options uh, moves. Let me uh, point out and let me focus on, on the right side here in terms of uh, a pass through. So the, the, the dotted lines here are the US, the solid lines are the EU area. And even though the policy rate in Europe has gone up by less and more slowly, uh, maybe uh, it's interesting to note that time deposits in the EU area have gone up more steeply than in the US. Uh, and in terms of overnight, uh, uh, also marginally overnight in the EU area has moved up more. So if you like in the EU, in the EU area, more of the adjustment is between overnight and, and term, whereas in America, I think people go to money markets and more of the adjustment is outside, out of the banking system into the money market. Uh, let me emphasize, going back to this recurrent point I have, which is the balance sheet reduction, where is it showing up? It is in our surveys, uh, but both the QE, the monetary policy portfolio, and the Teltro, uh, until the middle of last year, the banks were saying, this is uh, basically helping us. Uh, you're creating so much liquidity, uh, we, we're going to provide more credit. Now that has turned around, in the shrinkage phase, they're now reporting one reason why we're tightening credit is the loss of these highly uh, liquid options to us. So in other words, it's, you need to go beyond the policy interest rates and look at the balance sheet to understand the behavior of European banks. Uh, let me compare what's going on now to previous cycles and what you see here, and we go beyond just the limited history of your area to also look at Bundesbank history, it is that this is a, a fairly sharp tightening, uh, much more rapid uh, than, than before for, for good reason. Um, and so we, we do have to think about uh, what we learned from these more gradual episodes uh, in the past but I won't dwell on this point for now. Um, but what we do see, which is striking, is there is very rapid adjustment in credit volumes in, in, in the Europe. So credit volumes were running about 40 billion a month uh, this time last year. They've been basically around zero since last autumn. So, so th this is a, a sharp uh, change in, in credit volumes. Uh, and on the right side, there's some uh, comparison to previous tightening episodes. The dotted green line is what would the models, predict, like the VARs predict, if all that happened was policy rates went up. Uh, and the solid green line is what's actually happened, and it's a lot lower, sharper. And again, the gap there can be maybe in, in, interpreted in terms of these uh, balance sheet reductions. So let me compare again uh, uh, to, to the US. I mean, in terms of loan supply credit standard uh, indices, I mean, there's obviously a tightening both sides, uh, um, uh, you see on the, on the left, but maybe I'll emphasize on the right, the solid blue line is, is European credit volumes to corporates. The orange is credit volumes here in America. And you can see here a much sharper stop in the European data. So credit volumes have come down in, in America, but much more gradually and from a higher level, whereas in Europe, uh, it, it came down much more sharply and it's not recovered, even though the supply shot, the, the supply shocks hit in Europe last year are reversing. Um, so we maintain this loan supply indicator to try and capture what's going on over and above the kind of uh, interest rate channel. Uh, and it's uh, moving up uh, quite a bit. Um, and in terms of loan supply going back again, you can link it to, to uh, the balance sheet as well as to, to the rising funding costs. But maybe I'll emphasize is the history of, of uh, loan supply shocks is it does reduce GDP. So, so what I have here is, if you like, the red line is the median. This is captured as a, if you have a loan supply shock that reduces credit by one percentage point of GDP, uh, these calculations say that the median is that it, it reduces GDP by 30 basis points. But there's a, a, a wide dispersion here. This is a, a meta-analysis across many studies. Uh, you can generate much bigger drops in GDP. You can drops generate smaller. Uh, but if you like, what I'm saying is, is the median is a drop uh, with uncertainty. 
Uh, what we've seen so far is large corporates are less affected, younger and smaller firms have seen a big turnaround in, in credit volumes. And again, going back to what Kristen said about the role of SMEs, especially in the European context, uh, that's quite something. So I know I, know I, I shouldn't overstep on time. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll just finish by saying, uh, so far we've seen a lot of movement in the financial sector. Uh, because you know, people move slowly in terms of their behavior, it's clear that, that we're only at the start of the impact of that on, on the real economy. Throughout the whole thing, I'm emphasizing there's an interaction with the macro developments, which have been relatively contained in Europe so far. But again, going towards risk factors, we have quite a good GDP forecast as the ECB. But if GDP uh, you know, doesn't grow in line with what we expect, then this banking channel will probably interact with that. And then going further, of course, all of this is in the context of essentially not much uh, indication of, of significant stress. Whereas if we get an exogenous shock to stress that lasts more, you know, more durably than the March shock, uh, then of course we would have to think about that. So all of that put together saying uh, we don't have a mechanical view of this. This episode is sufficiently unique. You can't just impose one set of calculations of about how monetary policy works. Uh, and this is why we're very uh, data dependent in, in calculating monetary policy in the upcoming meetings. And we will we will have some news before the, the next meeting. Uh, this bank lending survey uh, will uh, be published a day or, two, day, day or two before the meeting. So let me let me stop there. That gives us uh, a lot to think about and we'll download your paper from the ECB website also. Can you hear me? It's on? Okay, thank you. Um, so let me go first back to, to Neil, who left uh, a lot uh, on, on the table from his uh, fuller remarks that are, that are available. Um, you, there seems to be a lot of unanimity about keeping the eye in the US on inflation and using other tools to address bank stability. And I want to connect this to Philip's comments about uh, the lending channel and the liquidity environment more generally. Um, but Neil, you, you said we should rely on um, supervisors and existing authority to focus on uh, banks and potential for insolvency and stability. So could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure, thank you. You know, if you think about it from the perspective of a bank, what can a bank do? today that is already facing large mark-to-market -market losses. The options are really limited. Number one, you could say, well, go try to raise equity. Well, if you look in the US, regional bank stocks on average have not recovered. So it's very difficult for a bank to raise equity in that context. Investors don't generally don't want to invest in funding somebody else's losses. And there's also the risk of a failed capital raise, which was the trigger for the SVB run in March. Number two, people talk about selling assets. Well, if you sell assets that are already lower marked, it doesn't do you any good unless somebody's willing to pay above market prices. So that's not really a realistic option. Third is to restrict your payouts. Many banks have already limited their share buybacks, so you're left with dividends. How many bank CEOs are going to willingly cut their own dividends? Very few because for fear of hurting their own stock prices. So that just very quickly lays out banks are not likely to take action on their own. So what could supervisors do? One option would be to run a new stress test that is a specific high inflation stagflationary scenario. Now, in a traditional stress test that we run, uh, what ends up happening, high interest rates, as Kristen said, the traditional view is high interest rates are good for banks. So a high inflation, high interest rate environment is a positive shock. So that's typically not very interesting to stress, so to speak. So you'd have to run a dedicated stress test showing a stagflationary scenario high inflation, high policy rates for an extended period of time, possibly leading over to credit losses on the real economy side as well, to really expose which banks are now exposed. Now, overall, as I mentioned, the US banking system is well capitalized. Overall, the US banking system is sound. I'm talking about exposing or identifying which are the individual regional banks that have a lot of exposure. And then using those results of the stress test, go to those individual banks and say, now you need to put together a plan to address this given the limited tools that the CEO has, that would then lead you to some type of uh, dividend payout restriction to build capital. The advantage of something like this that I see it is it, it reminds me of the 09 stress test. You know, the Federal Reserve did the stress test in 09, 
went through this very complicated analysis and then said, this is the assessment of where banks are. If banks take these steps, we have confidence they can endure this high inflation scenario. So in a sense, it'd be confidence. I think it would be confidence boosting because the regulators have said, supervisors have said, we think this plan works. And now if inflation then falls from here, as markets expect, and as we all hope, then this will be this problem will largely go away and banks could then return capital to their shareholders once we're through this inflationary episode. So I don't think we are uh, uh, incapable of addressing this. I do think it would take some very sharp supervisory actions to make sure that every bank it was in a position to endure this. Well, well just quickly to, to cross-reference uh, Neil on stress testing, uh, for those of you who keep track, the European Banking Authority uh, stress test of European banks essentially does this kind of stagflationary shock. Uh, quite a big drop in GDP coming from a supply shock, quite a big increase in inflation and interest rates. Uh, and uh, those results are coming out at the end of July. So, so you can you can see for yourself that point. I'll actually jump in there too. The Bank of England just released this morning a result of a stress test that was similar to what you, you announced. They hit interest rates going up to 6%, which probably seemed high when they did the test. Now they're getting pretty close. Their market expectations are five and a half, but they hit unemployment more than doubling to eight and a half percent, inflation to 17%, and house prices falling by about a third. And, and then they ran exactly the scenario you did. Banks looked like they were well capitalized for now, but uh, I think that is a good example of what should be done more in the future. So the in the in the theme of thinking about if not uh, if not working through policy rates, what other tools can be used? So supervision. Um, Philip emphasized for the ECB the credit restrictions working through banks and through the lending channel. Um, so for the U.S., what are the alternate tools that would work through the lending channel to change the liquidity environment? And you know, we had talked about quantitative tightening, taking a different approach to um, the balance sheet. Are there, are there options along the line for the U.S. along the lines that uh, Philip described were effective uh, in Europe, recognizing the very different institutional environment. Uh, I mean, I think it's certainly uh, theoretically possible if you wanted to, you know, you could change the balance sheet runoff in the US to try to have an effect on the long end of the yield curve. At the end of the day, a lot of the dynamics we've been talking about for banks is really about the shape of the yield curve. An inverted yield curve does not work for banks because their funding costs are higher than their lending costs. And if that's uh, an inverted yield curve for an extended period of time, a lot more banks are going to feel a lot of pressures as a result of that. So ultimately, in terms of your outlook for the banking sector, you need to take some outlook for the yield curve and how long it's going to be inverted and how high rates are going to go. Um, I, for one, would be loath to uh, tweak our balance sheet runoff. I think our balance sheet is running off in a, at a brisk pace, roughly twice the rate that we did in the last balance sheet runoff. It's been quite effective going on in the background. Financial institutions have been able to plan for it, have been able to adjust to it. I, for me, I think the bar would be quite high in tweaking our path for the balance sheet runoff. Jump in, it's a tool I wish we could use, except unfortunately the US did not set it in place well enough in advance, is greater use of countercyclical capital buffers. You know, the Bank of England has used the CCYB. Again, I think they could have used it more aggressively. Other countries have. The U.S. has been slow to do that, and that would be an easy fix right now without having to get into changing balance sheet runoff or other other issues of if there is more of a problem in the banking system without having to bank off what you're doing with interest rates. I'm going to go back to, to Philip with one uh, question about banking stability before we open it up so you can think of your questions. Um, we, one of the additional, we, we've mostly focused on the regional banks in the US, but of course there was a, a big failure uh, in Europe writ large of credit suites being taken over by UBS. And Philip was quick to point out to me that that's a Swiss bank. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so, so his responsibility and, and authority is limited there, but, uh, we did want to ask about spillovers, uh, for the rest of Europe. Uh, yes. So I, I'm sure the Swiss people in the room will, will agree with me. Switzerland is not part of the, uh, EU. Um, I, I, and, uh, 
what is it obviously uh with this case this was a kind of a essentially a, a, a global bank it, it, it was not something that the, the problems were not emerging from a the European situation, it, it had its kind of business model issues, if you like. Uh, but but the potential spillover was, was essentially uh, the decision, uh, if you like, to, to kind of surprisingly uh, write down the, the value of AT1 bonds uh, using kind of supervisory discretion. Uh, and since this was uh, not expected, even though it was in the documentation, there was a risk there could be a spillover to uh, the AT1 market where a, a lot of contingent capital is raised by European banks, uh, but the you know supervisory authorities in Europe were pretty quick to come out and say uh, that what happened in Switzerland was possible under Swiss law. It, it's not something that's envisaged under European Union law, uh, and that market has been reopening, um, and it remains an open question of whether it was basically a, a temporary. Uh, uh, episode in terms of spillover or whether there may be some longer term footprint. But right now, because the market is reopening, uh, uh, I wouldn't say the worst case scenario is developing.